enjoy and pay attention fully. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us at the Livingstone Assembly. My name is Jimmy Poon, and I'm honored and humbled to be able to share God's word with you today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you that we can worship you on this Sunday morning. We thank you for your love. Thank you for the mercies you've shown us by sending your son, Jesus Christ, that through his sacrifice, we can draw near to you. We can call you Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you've done. And I just want to lift up this time to you and invite Holy Spirit to come, uh, not just in this place, but in the homes of everyone who is watching this uh, sermon. Just pray the Holy Spirit will speak to each of us, uh, and may your presence be with us. We declare that Jesus, you are the King of kings, and you're the Lord of lords, and you reign over all the nations of the earth. Declare your name over this earth. In your holy name we pray. I mean, okay, so today, uh, okay, so it's a little bit easier for me to be able to see the slides. Uh, so the title of today's sermon is The, the Key of David. Uh, today I'm going to share with you some really uh, deep spiritual things. Uh, I think it's important that that we, we need to, to really go deeper into the scripture and, and really understand what the word of God tells us. Because it's a crucial time that we move in the spirit and we need to move, uh, in the heart of God. We need to know what God, what God's heart is now, what he wants to do and walk in line with his heart. So the key of David, uh, you hear that term in Revelation. Okay, uh, we're going to come to that later, but uh, first uh, I'm going to go quickly. Is this thing working? Turn. Let me try to. Is it turned on? Maybe it's not turned on. Okay, what's better when it's turned on? It's still not working. Can you try? Uh, first, we're going to go through some basic things that I have preached on before. Uh, you know, we are not just, each of us is not just what we see in the mirror. We are spirit, soul, and body. When you go back to Genesis, when God created Adam, he formed him with the dust of the earth. And then he breathed the breath of God into Adam. And, and the Bible says, a, a living soul. Okay. So, so man is created with the spirit of God in us. So entering the body, so we have spirit, soul, and body. That was when Adam was the perfect man. But then Adam Okay, and sin entered the world, the Bible says. So so I don't know if there's a pointer here. Anyway. Every person who was born after Adam no longer had the Holy Spirit until Jesus came. Okay, when Jesus came, that those who put out their faith in Jesus Christ, washed by the blood of Jesus, 
called born again or born from above. So we have spirit coming into the soul again. So that's why we are born again. We are called born again or born from above because now our spirit who was dead before now comes to life. So it's important to realize that we are spirit, soul, and body. Okay? So going back to Genesis, I always let it go back to the basics. Oh, because a lot of times you read through scriptures and we don't even understand what it means. You need to stop and think. Okay, why, why is it written that way? Okay, so if you read Genesis 1.1, it's like, that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now, heavens, heavens is in plural. Okay? So that verse actually speaks volumes, okay? Because, oops, I didn't touch it. And physical world, okay? So before creation, it was just God, and then he decided, which one? One, two, one, two. Okay, now you can hear me. All right, so. Uh, so we are spirit, soul, and body, and Genesis 1.1 tells us that God created everything, both spiritual and physical. Okay, the Bible did not expand on what actually was done, but if you think... If you look at other books like in Job and other places, it talks about the angels cheering God when uh, God was creating. So, so obviously he created heaven, so he would dwell in the heaven. So that's a spiritual entity. He created angels, and then he proceeded to create uh, what is described in the rest of Genesis. Okay, so God created heavens is in plural, and if you read the Bible carefully, uh, you notice that heavens, really there are three levels of heaven. Because in 2 Corinthians 12, 2, Paul said, I know a man in Christ, that's, he's talking about himself, who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or out of body I do not know, God knows, such a man was caught up to what? The third heaven. All right? So there, Paul is saying, I was taken up in the spirit to the third heaven. I didn't even know where I, my body went or just my spirit went, but I was hanging up the third heaven. All right? So we need to realize, so there are three levels of heaven. The first heaven is physical. If you look up in the sky, the atmosphere, and even if you have now, we have telescope, we have, we can look into space, we see the different stars, the galaxies, and so on. That's the physical heaven. Okay? That's the first heaven. And the second heaven, it's a battleground between the angels and the fallen angels, uh, you know, led by Satan. And in the third heaven is where God dwells. That's where Paul was taken up to. Okay, so in Revelation 12, uh, verse 3, it says, Then another sign appeared in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, that is Satan. All right, and then verse 4, And his tail swept away a third of the stars of heaven. And hurl them to the earth. Basically, a third of the angels, you know, followed Satan and fell. And then come to verse seven. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon, that is Satan. The dragon and his angels waged war, and they did not prevail. And there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. All right. So that verse tells you that this is the second heaven where the angels and 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 Satan's fallen angels are fighting it out. And if you remember uh, in the book of Daniel, when Daniel prayed and the, 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 the angel Gabriel went and tried to deliver a message to, to, to Daniel, but then he was delayed. He had to fight through. You know, the angels coming from third heaven, dispatched by God, 
He's trying to reach the earth, but he had to go through the second heaven. And he was delayed. And then he said, oh, Michael, the archangel, help me out so I could get loose and come and send you this message. All right. So if you read the scripture and think, then you catch what really the reality is. Okay, we have to think spiritual things, not just physical things. That's very crucial. Okay, that's crucial uh, to be able to walk uh, in the plan of God and to, to really uh, fulfill God's plan. All right, we pray this prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why did Jesus teach us to pray that way? It's because God is omnipotent. He's almighty. He can do anything just by one word. Things will be changed. But he chooses to uh, execute his plan through us. We have to cooperate with him so that his will in heaven, obviously, God's will always get done, but on earth won't get done unless men cooperate with him. He chooses it that way. Do you understand? This is very important. Just like why did Daniel have to pray? And at the minute he prayed, God answered his prayer. Because God wanted to release his plan. But he cannot do it unless men cooperate on earth and pray and act. Okay, so this is very Important spiritual principle. Okay, so now this is uh, version four. After these things, I looked and behold a door, that's John speaking, a door op standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I have heard, like the sound of trumpet speaking, he said, Come up here and I will show you what must take place after these things. And immediately I was in spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and someone sitting on the throne. So this is the description of. The third heaven, John, a door in heaven opened, and John was taken up in the spirit to the throne of God, to heaven, the third heaven itself. All right, so that's the scriptural basis for, like, everything I speak to is from the scripture. Okay, I don't make things up. But a lot of times you read it, if you don't understand, it just, you just miss it. It just, you know, it goes in and goes out. You read it, but you didn't really catch what it's trying to tell you. All right? Now, let's go back. Uh, I'm sure some of you have read uh, the book of Job. You know, Job was a great guy. Okay, fear God. Uh, uh, he was also very rich. He had seven sons, three daughters. He had tons of money, lots of cattle and sheep. Okay, and so on. So he was abundantly blessed. Like he he. He feared God, he offered up sacrifices to God just, just in case my children sin. So God really liked him. And guess what happened? If you read the, the book of Job, in uh, chapter 1, verse 6, Now there was a day when the sons of God, that is the angels, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. You're going to scratch your head. Oh, wait a minute. I mean, Satan is fallen. He's the enemy of God. And yet, he comes before God's presence? How does that happen? Well, I'll come to that. I'll, I'll answer that question. Okay? You have to think, how come when the angel present himself before God, Satan also came? He's already fallen. All right? This is after Adam and Eve's sin. All right? And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from roaming about on the earth and walking around it. So I can just, you know, Going around and checking things out and checking out different humans and see how they're doing. Why? Well, the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? He's an upright man and so on and so forth. And then Satan answered the Lord, does Job fear God for nothing? All right? So here's a troublemaker. He goes to, he goes to God and says, hey, I know you see this guy Job. He seemed to fear you. He offered sacrifice to you. It's all because you've been good to him. Okay, take away his good stuff and see how he's going to be like. So, okay, God said, okay, fine. So anyway, so God, uh, Satan went down and really did a number on Job, killed all his children, wiped out all his belongings and everything else. Okay, and then in Job 2, okay, so Satan came back to, to, to God's presence and God said, okay, see, in verse 3, the Lord basically said to Satan, look, See, Job's still good 
like he still respects me. He still fears me. He still, you know, makes sacrifice to me. See, after you, what you've done to him. And he said, although you incited me against him to ruin him. See, this is what Satan's plan. He didn't go up to, to God to, to say, hey, Jimmy is a good guy. Like he did, did this for you and so on and so forth. No, he go and say, aha, you see what he did? Bad boy, bad boy. That's what he's doing. All right. Uh, so, oops, what happened? I lost the slides. I clicked, but then it's blank. See? Something's wrong here. Where's the next slide? So anyway, I'll just keep going. You realize that uh, in heaven, third heaven, we already heard uh, from John that he went up to the throne of God right in the third heaven but there's more than just the throne of god in the third heaven that is why i'm trying to share with you okay uh anyway i'll just keep talking uh if you uh read carefully the bible in the book of hebrews uh in in heaven in the third heaven it's not just the throne of god okay there is also the throne of grace, okay? In Hebrew uh, chapter four, talks about, so let us draw near to the throne of grace so that we can obtain mercy and find grace in time of need, in the book of Hebrew chapter four. Okay, so, so there's a place called the throne of grace in heaven. And then in Hebrews uh, 12, uh, it talks about, really the court of heaven there's a court that actually is in heaven and we need to understand that okay now we get the slide back okay thank you the next slide okay in revelation 12 okay uh verse 10 and 11 John said, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters has been thrown down, the one who accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of the testimony, and they did not love their life even in face with death. Now let's just pause for a moment and think about that. The accuser, that's Satan, okay, he is in heaven accusing us believers, okay, brothers and sisters, day and night, just like what he did to Job. Okay, there's a slight difference here because back in Job's time, Jesus has not completed the salvation plan, okay? So there was no blood of Jesus up there or anything else, which I'm going to come later, okay? So Job just went up to heaven God basically to accuse us. But now there's a court setting in heaven that says actually goes to court in heaven and accuse me, accuse you, accuse anyone who's a believer. Because the non believe he doesn't care. Those, you know, is following him. They didn't even know it, right? So, and it says, they, that is referring to your brothers and sisters, overcame Satan. How do we overcome Satan? By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. And we do not love our lives even with face with death. What does that mean? That means we put our faith in Jesus and surrender totally to him. Okay, I mean, there's Christians, quote unquote, and there's Christians. Let me tell you, okay, anybody who said the sinner's prayer or even, you know, gone through baptism and come to church can call themselves a Christian. But are you really, really Christian? Christian means a little Christ. Do you belong to Jesus? 
How did Jesus pay for our sin debt? He paid for it with his whole life. He died for us. So the least we can do is to offer our whole life back to him. Listen carefully. It's not just saying a prayer. It's not just going through baptism. If you really, really think about it, Jesus is God. He left the throne in heaven. He became a man. And he died in our praise. Just imagine the magnitude of what happened. If you really believe that, the least thing we need to do is say, I surrender all to you. Okay? This is the key. All right? So it's not just, oh, I did this, I did this, I did this. No, no, it's not about ritual, it's not about all that. It's about our heart. Are we totally surrendered to Him? I mean, yeah, we're human. God understands, God knows. But do you have the intention of doing it? That's the key. All right? To be able to walk, to experience God, that's a very crucial step. That's the step we all need to take. Do we really believe it? If we do, then the verse says, we do not love our life. We surrender all. Okay, that's key. So, so on the basis of that, then we can overcome Satan. Because if you don't, then Satan <sighs> would love it. Because he, you know, we won't be able to overcome him. Because that's, the, that's what the Bible says. We need to put our total faith in Jesus, trust him, and then how do we overcome him? By the blood of the Lamb and by the word of a testament. Now what does that mean? You can many people quote that verse. Oh yeah, we walk him by this, by this. Well then how? Show me how. It's like you have a recipe in a cookbook until you actually cook that meal or bake that cake. It's just a whole bunch of instructions. You haven't done anything. Alright, so, so how how do you apply the blood? How what what is the word of testimony? What what is it talking about? Aha. Okay, I'm gonna review you. The truth behind this. In Luke 18, Jesus gave this parable. All right? He says, a certain city of judge, do not fear God, do not care, respect people. There's a widow, and then she kept coming to him, give me justice against my opponent. For a while, this judge was unwilling, and later he said to himself, oh, even though I don't really care, yet because this widow is bothering me, I give her justice. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. And the Lord said, listen, this is Jesus saying, listen to what the righteous judge said. The, sorry, the unrighteous judge said. Now, will God not bring about justice for his elect, who cry out to him day and night, and will he delay long for them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? So, what is this parable telling us? What's Jesus, what message is Jesus telling us? He's comparing God to this unrighteous judge. I mean, he's just really making the most extreme, extreme, you know, contrast. Okay, well, God is obviously the righteous judge uh, and, and just judge. All right? But he's saying if this guy who is not a good judge will deliver justice for you, how much more our judge, okay? He's referring to God as judge, okay? You've got to remember, God is our father, but God is also judge. Don't forget the kingdom of God, the foundation of the kingdom of God is what? Righteousness and justice is the foundation of God's throne, all right? He cannot go back again his word. He's God. He can do anything, but if he says something in his word, that's the law of the kingdom of God. You've got to realize that, okay? God is bound by his own righteous law because he is righteous. He cannot be unrighteous. That's who he is. And he judges. So Jesus is telling us, go to the judge. Okay? Don't give up. Keep going until you get justice. All right? So, I mean, there are different ways to pray. We can go to the throne of grace and ask for mercy, ask for, oh, I need this, oh, 
Father, you know, you know my situation. I need a job. I need this. I need, I'm sick. I need heal me. Sure, that's fine. That's that's one aspect of God. Sometimes we we end up in trouble. We in a mess, and we just question, like, "Ooh, what happened? How come everything I do go wrong?" Well, think of there's another element here. It's the accuser. It's Satan. Just like what he did to Job, he can do it to you or to me. And how how can he do that? He said, "Oh, I'm a child of God. God's going to protect me." Well, in a sense, yes, but God is also bound by law. If I did something wrong, or if you did something wrong, that gives Satan a legal reason to go to the court of heaven and curse you or curse me, and say because you know. It's all in the word of God. Remember, you know the the Israelites when they left Egypt, they had one on Mount Gerizim, one group on Mount Gerizim, one one Mount Ebal, and one side proclaimed blessing. If you obey the law, bless you, bless you, bless you. And then on the other side, curse, 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 curse. Okay, so that's what it is. So Satan would go and accuse us in heaven, the court of heaven. Ask me what what happens, okay? So I already mentioned uh, there's a throne of grace, a throne of worship. There's a throne of grace, and there's a court of heaven. There's a temple of heaven. There are at least four things that I can find in the third heaven. Okay, already uh, we've already read this before, so that is. The throne of worship. Okay, John was taken up in the spirit in heaven and saw the worshiping in heaven. That's the worshiping throne. And then there's the temple of God. If you read carefully, the book of Revelation is in, in several places. You see the temple of God. This is just one place. Revelation 11:19 and a temple of God, which is in heaven. Okay, remember when. When the Lord instructed Moses to build the, the tabernacle of Moses, He gave him with very specific instructions, every little detail, because this is a copy of the real stuff in heaven. That's a temple. There's actually a temple in heaven. Okay, which of which the the tabernacle of Moses or later on the Solomon's temple is a copy of the real thing. All right, so there's actually a temple. Of God in heaven.、Uh, now we come to this verse, <clears throat> which the、uh, today's sermon on the key of David. This is、uh, Jesus speaking、uh, in Revelation three seven and eight, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, He who is holy, who is true. Who is the key of David? Who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one opens? Says this: I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door, which no one can shut, because you have a little power and have followed my word, have not denied my name. Okay, I've underlined the key words there. So he is speaking to the church in Philadelphia. Okay, the seven churches. I'm sure a lot of you have read it. The the seven churches. Uh, seven letters to seven churches in the book of Revelation in you know, in the first three chapters.、Uh, so this is one of the churches. It's called Philadelphia. It's a place called Philadelphia in Asia Minor, which is current day Turkey. Okay, there's an actual church there. Okay, Philadelphia.、Uh, so he tells them, "I have the key of David." Jesus said, "I hold the key of David." Okay, so what? What is that? And then he he said, and then he followed by, "I give you an open door." Remember, we just read John in the the, the next chapter, verse four, and then he saw a door open in heaven, and he was taken up to heaven. So Jesus is talking about he holds the key to the kingdom of heaven. The key of David is access to heaven. Okay, that's the key of David. And how do you get that key? Follow my word or obey my word. 
do not deny his name. That means you put your faith in the name of Jesus. What does that mean? That means you believe in him. Jesus is our Savior. Okay? He is the Son of God. He's our Savior. So if you put your faith in Jesus, you proclaim his name, you have the authority. If you obey God's command, you cannot, you know, openly rebel against his word. Just like the Israelites, then you're no good. Understand? Just being a Christian doesn't mean you get away with anything. All right? It means that you have to, what? I mean, I'm, again, back to the fact that we're human. We are going to stumble and fall sometimes, sin and so on and so forth. But the intention is that we try our best to obey him. And the moment the Holy Spirit reminds us that we've done something wrong, we repent and follow the Lord. That's, that's really very basic, very simple things we need to understand. So once we do that, you see, the scripture is very clear. You just read it carefully. It's all there. The message is repeated again and again and again. Put your faith in Jesus. Obey God. Then you have access to heaven. All right? And let's look at another scripture. Matthew 16. In, uh, Jesus asked his disciples, Okay, people who have called me all kinds of things. Some things, some people say that I'm a prophet, I think that I'm Elijah, whatever, whatever. And then, who do you say I am? Okay, he asked his disciple. And this is Peter's reply. Or Simon, his name is called Simon. So Simon replied, oh, you are the son of the living God. That's Peter Simon's reply to Jesus. And then this is what Jesus said to him. And I also say to you that you are Peter, Petra. And upon this rock, I will build my church, ecclesia. That is the Greek for church, all right? And the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Now let's stop and think. What did Jesus just say? Okay, because Peter proclaimed that Jesus, you are the Son of God. So he, bang, stepped into that realm. Remember, we just said you declare your faith in Jesus as the Son of God. All right, you pray him and you obey him. All right, and now you have access to heaven. And Jesus said, Good, upon this proclamation that I'm the Son of God, I'm going to put you. In a position, Peter, as like a foundation to build my church, okay, based on your proclamation. And what when it says gates of Hades, gates of Hades, gates, you know, when you read the Bible, the gate, it means, you see, when you have a city, at the city gate is where the authority is. If you attack a city, you have to take over the gate. And people meet at the gate, There's the city elders and those have political power. So the gates means the authority, the power. That means the power, some translations actually translate the power of Hades or the power of darkness. That means Satan and all his gang cannot overcome you. That's really what it says. All right? And upon this program, is I build what? My ecclesia. And it's been translated English church. And you say church, we think of, oh, yeah, this building. We go to church. Okay, a magnificent building, a church. No, ecclesia is not the building. Okay, ecclesia, literally, that Greek word I put in bottom here, means those who are called out into an assembly. Okay, that word Used that Greek word used to describe the people who are members of a senate or parliament, a place, you know, a, 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 an assembly that governs. Okay, so that speaks volume. Like, you understand, when we think of church, oh, a group of people, even like, which is technically correct, a church is people, the people who worship God. Yes, it's not wrong, but, but, you need to understand the primary meaning of ecclesia. Ecclesia is those who, who has the authority to govern. That is so crucial. Christians have given up the authority 
to govern, to bring God's will in heaven down to earth, and you let the enemy run the show. Satan would just love it. Yeah, you Christian, just sit in church and sing songs and pray, and yeah, 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 yeah. <sighs> we need to take our authority. We are the ecclesia. We are representatives. We are the, the Bible calls us ambassadors of heaven. We are citizens of heaven. But we are citizens of heaven sent from heaven to be on earth to execute God's will. All right? We need to pray according to the will of God and then take action. All right? So this is very important, especially nowadays. This is a very crucial time. Very crucial time. Okay? So, now we understand what ecclesia or church means. Okay? And we have what? The key of the kingdom of heaven, which is the key of David, which I mentioned before. We have access to heaven. Now that goes back to my initial teaching about spirit, soul, and body. Don't just think that we are on earth. We are actually we can access heaven in the spirit. Read this in Ephesians 2, 4 to 6. But God, being rich in mercy, because of great love with which he loved us, even though Okay. Testing, testing. Okay, now we're we're back. Testing. Okay, so it says, but God, being rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our wrongdoings, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with Him, and what? Seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Just think about what this verse just said. Is it talking about that someday when we die, when we raise again, we'll, we'll be in heaven with Jesus? Or is it talking about now? It's talking about now. Exactly. Thank you. So, the minute we're in Christ, in Christ meaning that when you believe and put your trust in Him, you're in Him. When you baptize, it's baptized into Him. Okay? You become part of Him. We keep saying the, the, the church is the body of Christ. Yeah, that's it. Ecclesia, okay? Jesus, even though he defeated Satan, he took, he said, remember, he said in, in Matthew 20, all authority in heaven and earth have been given to me. Therefore, go, and so on and so forth, right? So he said, all authority has been given. So he has the authority. He took the When Adam and Eve sinned, they handed the authority to Satan because they obey Satan. And when Jesus defeated Satan on the cross, he took that authority back. All right, and he gave this authority to us, the ecclesia, who is his body, to execute his will on earth. Okay, so we are seated in the heavenly places. Okay, we talked about this already. Hebrew four sixteen. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we receive mercy and find grace for help in at the time of our need. So we, where's the throne of grace? In heaven, right? So what does this verse say? We actually can go to the throne of grace and say, Father, I need mercy, I need help. That we can do because we're in Jesus. Okay? Now, this is the other part. That is the key of what uh, I'm going to, I want, what I want to share with you today. Hebrews 12, 22-24. But you have come to Mount Zion, 
and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to the mirrors of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. You read that verse and you say, oh, what is it talking about? I'm going to break it down for you. Okay, think spiritual. There are seven things listed there. Okay, Mount Zion is where, we, where, where God is. Okay, it's the government of God. Mount or mountain represent government. Okay, that's in the Bible. Mountain is government. So the government of God, okay, and there's a court in this government. It says about God, the judge of all, all right? So God, as I mentioned before, God is our Father. You can approach the throne of grace and say, Father, I have mercy. Father, I need help. That's fine. That's a different place. But when Satan's go to this court, you go to the court. You can't say, Father, spare me. He can't do that. He's a judge, all right? You cannot simply say, because I'm your son, you forgive me. No! He sent Jesus, and even Jesus had to die to pay for sin. All right? So when he's a judge, it's a totally different ball game. All right? So judge, and who's Jesus? He's our defense attorney. Okay? He's the mediator of new covenant. Okay? He's standing there on behalf of of us as our defense attorney. When, Jesus, when, when, when Satan goes up and accuses us and says, oh, see what Jimmy did? Mm, bad boy, bad boy. He's going to go to court and do that. And Jesus tried to defend us. But can he just defend us up there by himself? Can you not go to court when somebody accuses you and just have you? No, you have to go there and testify, right? So that's the key. The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is just not, you know, you look at the blood. It's not just blood. It's life. Remember the Bible talk about the life is in the blood. Okay? So the blood has life. The blood can speak. Okay? The blood of Jesus was shed. And it talks about what? Speaking better word than that of Abel. See that? The blood, what's the blood saying? If you read Genesis, when, uh, you know, Cain killed Abel and the blood was shed. And what did, what did God say to Cain? The blood of Abel was crying out. Because for what? Justice. Right? Okay, he wanted revenge. Cain, kill me. Do something. But the blood of Jesus doesn't say that. If the blood of Jesus says, oh, Jesus was killed. These guys killed Jesus. Then we're in trouble. <laughs> But that's not what the blood said. The blood says, what did, what did Jesus say? Forgive them, Father, for they do not know what they do. So the blood of Jesus speaks something better than the blood of Abel. The blood of Jesus is crying for mercy for those who put their faith in Jesus, in the blood of Jesus. He said, have mercy. Even though, yes, this person sinned, but on account of, me, of, of blood being shed, you now have the legal right to forgive that person. Do you understand? That is why Jesus had to be sent, because there's a court, there's a righteous, there's a law of the kingdom of God that has to be fulfilled. Every sin has to be punished. Okay, so instead of us being punished, Jesus was punished and his blood was shed, and his blood now cry out in the court of answering, mercy for all those who put their faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That is the simple truth, so foundational. And then there is the spirits of righteous. Remember in Hebrew 12, we talk about this cloud of witnesses in heaven cheering for us. These are Old Testament saints who've gone before us, who've been tested, they've been martyred, and all kinds of things, and they went on and now their spirits are in heaven sitting there watching the New Testament saints. They are saying, oh, come on, keep going, keep going, all right? They're cheering for us. And while well, we go down to the angels, they're just spectators, all right, mirror of angels. And then the general assembly, that means the, the assembly of the court session. And the last thing is the church of firstborn. 
who are enrolled in heaven. Not just every Christian who call himself Christian who just pray that sinner's prayer. Remember? Remember? They are sons and they are firstborn sons. He says about what? Church of the firstborn. Okay? These are overcomers. These are people who put their faith in Jesus. These are people who have the authority to go to the court of heaven and defend themselves and defend their nation and defend their city and, and speak for the persecuted people. All right? It's those who truly put their faith in Jesus and who are willing to lay down their lives for Jesus, who have the courage and boldness to do that, to face in spite of persecution, in spite of dangers and trials, we persevere. So that's the key. Okay, now going back to the accuser, so Satan, where does he accuse us? He goes to the court of heaven. All right? I've done something wrong. Satan sees it. Satan says, I'm going to take Jimmy out. All right? So bad things start to happen to me. God will allow that to happen because he has a legal right because I did something wrong. So he goes to, you know, even Job, he didn't actually do anything wrong. He, he actually created trouble for Job. Okay? What more if I or some of you actually did something wrong? Satan with a field day there. So, how do we defend? Now, this verse makes sense. They overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. The word of our testimony is not in this context. Does not mean we go out and give the testimony. Oh, how I've become safe. Oh, I'm so bad. I can, when I... You know, put my faith in Jesus. Now I've changed. Yes, that's that's a testimony we give to unbeliever. That's different. That's a testimony. But but this testimony is talking about court testimony. You go to court and give the testimony. How do you give it? Always standing on God's word. It's a very. I mean, there are other verses, but this is, I think, a very good verse to use. Colossians two thirteen and fourteen. And when you were dead in your wrongdoings and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our wrongdoings. Forgiven us, what? All our wrongdoings. Having canceled the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against that which was hostile to us, that is Satan, putting in the accusation. Satan goes to court and says, I'm accusing Jimmy. He's done this, 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 and this. So he, he, he puts in the court, the papers, to accuse me. But what did Jesus do? Cancel the certificate of debt, consistent decrees against us, against every believer in Jesus Christ, which was hostile, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. This is the word of God. You go to the court of heaven. First, you repent. I go up there, and it's best to go with another brother or sister because you need two. To actually, I, I won't go into that because there are other places talk about. Uh, maybe I will say that. Remember, Jesus say, uh, whenever two of you agree, okay, it will be done in heaven. If you read the context of that verse, he's talking about going to court. Okay, I mean, you probably miss it. We say, oh yeah, we agree, we pray, and we agree. I mean, that's not wrong. But in the context of what he's saying, he's talking about when you go to court, because in Deuteronomy, in the law of Moses, you know, because you go to, every testimony has to be two witnesses, not just one, to establish a testimony. So you need two to go to the court of heaven. Don't just go there yourself and declare a testimony. What is the testimony? He says, yes, I'm sorry, I did that. I confess I was wrong. Okay, I repent. I try my best not to do that again. And you quote this. But your word says that you have forgiven all my wrongdoing because Jesus has canceled the certificate that can sin decrees against me. And therefore, I ask the court to declare me not guilty because 
the blood of Jesus will stand there speaking for on my behalf. And de my defense attorney said, yes, even though he sinned, he's been forgiven. So this accusation has no legal right anymore. Cancel that. It's been nailed to the cross once and forever. And this is how we get off. Okay? And then, going back to this verse, remember? He said, uh, Jesus said to, to Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. That means you have access to the kingdom of heaven, to, to the corner of heaven, to the throne of grace. Okay? You have access to all that. And whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. What does that mean? Remember, again, it's all in the word of God. If someone sinned, Satan has a legal right to hurl curses, just like the Israelites, you know. If you, you do this, this they, they, they declare all these curses. But God his heart is to want to bless his children. But God cannot bless you because you're cursed. Because legally, he cannot. So what do we do? Go to the court of heaven and bind the curses that come from Satan. And ask the Father to lose the blessing. You get it? It's so beautiful. It's on the word of God. Okay? So, so when, now we know... In the spirit, we have an open door in heaven. We have the key to the kingdom of heaven. We have the key of David. We need to use it. We need to use it. Okay. I'm gonna okay I'm gonna share with you this story quickly. If you read First King, when King David became old, he was weak, he was in bed. So his son's trying to you know, jostle in the position to become kings. All right? But remember, David promised his wife Bathsheba. I mean, David has many wives, but Bathsheba is the one he likes. You remember the story of Bathsheba, right? <laughs> anyway, we'll go into that. But after they got married, after David repented, okay, uh, he promised Bathsheba that their youngest son, Solomon, would become king. But as David was getting old in bed, Let's just read this quickly. Now the Adonijah, the son of Haggith, that's another son, because David has many sons, many wives, okay? This other son exalted himself, saying, I will be king. So he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen and, and 50 men to run before him. And his father had never built him at any time by asking, why are you doing this? Okay, but he was a handsome man. He was born after Absalom. I don't know if you remember the story of Absalom. Absalom also one of David's sons. Absalom actually rebelled against David and tried to kill him and become king eventually. But David still loved Absalom. Even though his son tried to kill him, he still loved him. He wept after he was killed. So this is not a guy like Absalom. Okay? He did not openly rebel David, but he waited till he's ready to die. Then he wanted to become king without David's permission. All right? He, he, he get 50 men, chariots, and this and so Now he had to confer with Joab. Joab is the commander-in-chief of David's army, all right? And with Abiathar, the priest, and they ally themselves with Adonijah. So basically, Adonijah do not have the authority to be king, but he just get a whole bunch of influential people and just make a huge party and say, ah, oh, I'm king. But Zadok, the priest, and Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, Nathan, the prophet, Shimi, Rie, and the mighty man who belonged to David, were not with Adonijah. So the faithful one follower of, of David did not go along with this other son, Adonijah. Okay, they, and Adonijah sacrificed sheep, oxen, fattened steers, and by the stone of Sohaleth, which is beside and Roger, and he invited all his brothers, the king's son, all the men of Judah, the king's servant, but he did not invite Nathan the prophet, Benaiah, the mighty man, his brother Solomon. So basically, the story goes like this. Okay, so Adonijah declared himself to be king without proper authority. And he made a big party, invited all the important people and a big feast. So Nathan, the prophet, went to Bathsheba and said, listen, 
this is what's going on. You and Solomon are going to be in trouble because if Adonijah become king, he's going to kill you. Right? So they went to David's bedside. And Bathsheba said to David, didn't you promise that Solomon's going to be king? And David said, yeah, I swore to you know, the living God that Solomon is going to be king. So and then Nathan, the prophet, went in and said, yeah, this is what, you know, uh, you promised. So you have the uh, legal authority to declare who's king and who's not king. Not this Adonijah, you know, son of yours who did not have the authority. Even though he, he made it look like he's king, he declared it, he made a big party and everything else. Okay? So anyway, so, so long story short, David gave the authority to, to Nathan and Zadok, the priest, they tell him, take Solomon, take my meal, go to uh, the tent and get the anointing oil, anoint Solomon to be king and let him sit on my throne. Okay? So, so, so the priest, the prophet, went and did just that, anointed Solomon. And, with, and then all the people went up after him and the people were playing on flutes and rejoicing with great joy so that the earth shook at their noise. So in spite of all this hoopla that Adonijah was doing with all his you know, supporters, all the people, all the elders, everybody was following you know, Adonijah, but the true king has the authority. All they have to do, but they need the prophet, you need the priest, okay, to exercise that authority. Now I've come to the, the crux of this sermon. How many of you believe that Joe Biden is the 46th president of the United States of America? Every single media has declared him to be the president. The whole world congratulated him, like Adonijah. Okay, I'm not here to, I'm not a, you know, I, I'm not, actually this is US politics, I'm not involved in politics, but I'm just telling you a very simple truth. A very simple truth. You recognize this? Probably not, another picture. This is a picture of Philadelphia. Where's Philadelphia? Pennsylvania. What are the two hottest items on the news these days? COVID-19 and US presidential election, right? <clears throat> okay. Let me share with you. This, there's, a, there's a prophet called Chris Reed. He shared this on uh, YouTube. God showed him a dream back in August. He basically, he saw people, a vision of people from every state of the United States. They all turn and look at Pennsylvania, the state of Pennsylvania. So he asked God, what does that mean? He said, that Pennsylvania is going to be the key state in this election. And then recently, just last week, he had a vision. He saw the feet of Jesus coming down. Coming down. And this is what Jesus said to him. This verse. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, He who is holy, who is true, who has the key of David, who opens and no one can shut, and who shuts and no one can open, says this, I know your deeds. Behold, I have put for you an open door which no one can shut because you have a little power and have followed my word and have not denied my name. And then he said, Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. I'll make them come and bow down before your feet and make them know that I have loved you because you have kept my word and persevered. I'll keep you from the our testing the hour which is about to come upon the whole earth to test those who, lie, who live on the earth. I am coming quickly. 
hold firmly to what you have, so that no one will take your crown. You may not like Donald Trump personally. You may not like his personality, what he says,、uh, maybe even his policy towards Canada and China, whatever, whatever. But this is not about him. Read this verse in Daniel two twenty one. It is He who changes the times and periods. Is it He, Jesus Christ, who removes kings and, and appoints kings? Okay, who actually become king? It's not up to us. It's up to God. And I'm sh- maybe some of you already heard many <clears throat> prophets saying that Donald Trump has been chosen by God to be. The president to accomplish his will. You may not like him, but look at the policies that speak for itself. He openly lifts up the name of Jesus Christ. I have not heard any politician openly declare that. He is a staunch support of Israel. He acknowledges that Jerusalem belongs to Israel. Jerusalem is in the heart of God. Jerusalem cannot be given to all these so-called, you know, religions. He is pro-life. He stands for freedom of religion, freedom of speech, and he speaks out for persecuted Christians. I challenge you, if you're a believer, any other politician in the world has this policy. Tell me. So it's not about whether you like him, his politics, whatever, whatever he says. You know, da 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 da. The media is trying to paint him like that, okay? But that's not the point. The point is, as a believer, as one who obey the word of God, these are policies that are in line with the word of God, okay? So the enemy does not want him to be there, and also. Well, I'm not going to go into that because there's a whole bunch of stuff going on, but the truth will come out. The truth will come out. Do you hear that in the media? No, not one single media. But Jesus is on this case. Okay, I'm telling you, and I'm going to go out on a limb. And they can actually sit Roth and this prophet Chris. We we pray. We went up to the court of heaven. We did exactly what. We did. Okay, it's not what Adonijah says. It's not what all the media says. They do not have the legal authority. Or to put in practical terms, the counting of the votes has to be certified in each state. That has not been done. So it doesn't matter what you say; it's not official. Okay, and and the truth has to come out. Okay, it has to be a fair election. If it's fair, that's fine. If the people choose Joe, that's fine. That's the people's choice. But if it's not, we need to find out the truth. Why are they so afraid to look to to dig into it to find out the truth? If there's nothing to be hidden, just like you know, in this side of the border, why did the We Charity deleted all the records if they have nothing to hide? Very simple question. Show us if there's nothing to hide. Why are you deleting it? Case in point. Okay, so I'm, I, as I said, I'm not here to make a political statement. I'm here to speak the truth and to speak the heart of God. I'm here to speak. In the name of Yeshua Hamashiach, that your will be done in Canada, your will be done in the United States of America, that your choice for the 46th president of the United States of America will be according to what you have chosen and what not everybody else is saying. We trust that as we are the prophets, we are the priests. Okay, as as you know, as the, your ecclesia. We have the authority to speak that. If you start lining up your word with the enemy, then the enemy wins. Do you trust? Put your trust in Jesus Christ. Do you put your faith in the truth? If you do, 
Just pray together with me. Father, we come to you in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. We know that our nation, Canada, has sinned. We know that the United States has committed things that is offensive to you. We repent on behalf of the respective governments. We come to you and ask for your mercy because the blood of Jesus uh, speaks mercy because your word says that you have forgiven all our wrongdoing. You have forgiven the wrongdoing of the government of Canada. You have forgiven the wrongdoing of the government of the United States and even the Trump administration. You have forgiven all the things that have been done wrong because Jesus has canceled the certificate of debt that is against these governments, against us, and, and, and he has nailed it to the cross. He has canceled it. So all the accusations, all the curses has been voided and nullified. And I speak blessing upon the nation of Canada. I speak blessing upon the nation of the United States of America. We stand with our brothers and sisters down, uh, in the United States of America as they plea, make the declaration in the heavenlies, in the heavenly courts, that Father and righteous judge, your will be done. You have chosen Donald J. Trump to be the 46th president of the United States of America. It will be done according to your word and let the truth come out. I declare that all the fraudulent activities will be exposed. All the wrongdoings, all the works of darkness will be exposed. You declare in the court of heaven and it will declare in the court in the United States. In the Supreme Court and even on the, in the, the courts in the different states. It, the truth will come out. We stand for righteousness and truth. For righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. We declare it, we believe it, and we trust you, Lord Jesus. Let your kingdom come and let your will be done. And let the blessing be poured out upon the United States of America and upon the land of Canada. And we ask that you lift up righteous politicians in different level of government in Canada so that your will be done. Expose the darkness. Expose the acts of darkness and the cheating. Whatever it's done by the politicians. Expose them. And let righteousness rise. Let justice rise in the land of Canada as well. In the name of Yeshua, I'm sure we pray. I mean. Thank you, Doc. Dr. Kuhn for the sermon. Um, before we wrap up, just a little uh, housekeeping. And uh, for, for those who are in, anticipating to join our um, in-church gathering, our church is continue to remain open uh, following the, the guidelines and policy from Toronto Public Health as, as, well, and, uh, as well as the Ontario government. Uh, we remain safe social distance of six feet, six feet and uh, for all the members who participate in, in church service, uh, we need to sign in and register as well as leaving the contact tracing and the health screening at the, at the reception door. And uh, for those anticipating to join us uh, for the coming weeks, please actually contact Nelson, Joshua, and Pastor Eddie uh, so we can actually arrange and plan for plan ahead for the arrangement. And uh, for individuals who are participating from home, please continue to stay tuned with the Livingstone Assembly English Ministry chat group, as well as the YouTube channel, and individuals can review the sermon and as the, the previous sermon for in case you have your in case you have missed the the Sunday sermon, and please share them among your friends and and uh, other fellow brothers and sisters, so we are connected in the body of Christ and uh, as we exit later on please uh, use the rear door for exit and uh, the, the the middle gate and the pa and the rear gate toward uh, Kennedy and Stills are open so um, we're gonna direct traffic from one way in and one way out from the back and uh, for Monday Wednesday and Friday um, 
every 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 Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, uh, from two o'clock to six o'clock, Pastor Soi would be from Mandarin service will be will be at church and uh, during his office hour. And individuals who uh, who would like to deliver the offering, you can do so um, if it suits your timetable. And I will pass the time to Pastor Eddie to um, for the benediction. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's all stand. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of our Heavenly Father, the counseling, the anointing, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us forever. Let all the saints say, Amen. Oh, God bless you and stay safe.